as a communist front. It is, at this instant, being distributed in hard communist agents and their dupes. This pamphlet, and numerous others like it, play a major role as artillery in one phase of the communist war to destroy our nation. A phase called by the communists, Operation, Operation. Abolition. Abolition. Ladies and gentlemen, Congressman Francis E. Walter, Democrat from Pennsylvania and Chairman of the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Operation Abolition. This is what the communists call their current drive to destroy the House Committee on Un-American Activities, to weaken the Federal Bureau of Investigation, to discredit its great director, J. Edgar Hoover, and to render sterile the security laws of our government. The Communist Party has given top priority to Operation Abolition and has assigned agents trained in propaganda and agitation to this project. The scenes which you uh, will be viewing were taken by newsreel photographers during hearings of the Committee on Un-American Activities in San Francisco, California on May the 12th, 13th, and 14th, 1960. During the next few minutes, you will see revealed uh, the long-time classic communist tactic in which a relatively few well-trained, hardcore communist agents are able to incite and use non-communist sympathizers to perform the dirty work of the communist party. You will see uh, Archie Brown, second in command of the communist party in California, Harry Bridges, an international communist agent and leader of the International Longshoremen's Union, who recently returned from conferences held with other leaders of communist-led longshoremen groups. Ralph Isard, one of the top communist propagandists, who was a welcome guest of the Red Chinese government while American soldiers we're giving their lives in the Korean War. You will see Douglas uh, Wachter, an agent trained to specialize in youth activities. William Mandel, another communist propagandist who serves the conspiracy in the fields of radio and television. Bertram uh, Edises, who is one of the elite corps of communist lawyers. Frank Wilkinson, recently convicted of contempt of Congress, who is in charge of the Citizens Committee to Preserve American Freedom, the West Coast headquarters of uh, Operation Abolition. You will see these and others in action and the shocking techniques which they use to incite others to violence. We are all too familiar with the pattern of communist led revolution and rioting in Venezuela, Cuba, and more recently in Japan. Can it happen here on American soil? This film, showing communism in action, will answer that question. This is City Hall in San Francisco, the site of hearings held by the House Committee on Un-American Activities in May of 1960. This is the chosen battlefield of the Communist Party's most organized and violent attack on the committee since the launching of the Operation Abolition Campaign on September 20th, 1957. Congressman Walter, chairman of the full committee, designated Congressman Edwin E. Willis of Louisiana as chairman of a subcommittee charged with the investigation of Communist Party activities in the Northern California area. Other members of the subcommittee are Congressman Morgan M. Mulder of Missouri, Congressman August E. Johansson of Michigan, and Congressman Gordon H. Scherer of Ohio. In an interview with the press, Congressman Willis explains more fully the reasons for the hearings. What we are here to do is to gather information, as we are ordered to, to do, by an act of Congress with respect to the general operation of the communist conspiracy, wherever it may lead. 
Uh, it's a mandate that law has been on the books for probably over 20 years. We receive our appropriations and are ordered every year to maintain this general surveillance uh, of the communist operations with the view of amending, improving, correcting uh, laws having to do with our internal security. The Internal Security Act of 1950, the Foreign Agents Registration Act, the Smith Act, uh, and so on. This is part and parcel of our general studies of the machinations of the communist conspiracy. The communist apparatus activated its trained agitators and propagandists in the San Francisco Bay Area months before the scheduled hearings were to begin. The carefully organized protest campaign was climaxed with a student directive published just prior to the hearings on the front page of the official University of California student newspaper, The Daily Californian. The directive reads as follows. The Student Committee for Civil Liberties plans to picket the hearings today. It has issued a call for students to attend the rally and hearings and suggests that people laugh out loud in the hearings when things get ridiculous. That is the end of the quote. Among the communist leaders who had an active part in the San Francisco abolition campaign and the protest demonstrations were Harry Bridges, whom you see here being escorted out of City Hall by police officials moments before the rioting broke out. Archie Brown, another longshoreman, played a major role in inciting the demonstrations against the committee. He is identified as the number two man in the California Communist Party and, admittedly, has been a party member for some 20 years. In the course of the three days of the hearings, Archie Brown had to be ejected from the hearing room on three separate occasions. Archie Brown was active in distributing propaganda pamphlets outside of the City Hall building. He had been subpoenaed by the committee as a witness. Another top communist agitator, also subpoenaed as a witness, was Merle Brodsky, whom you see here participating in the chanting and singing demonstrations immediately outside the hearing room. Merle Brodsky was ejected from the hearing room on two separate occasions for leading demonstrations while the committee was receiving testimony. Young Douglas Walker, another Communist Party member, played an important role in the student riots. A sophomore at the University of California, Douglas Walker was a delegate, together with his father, Saul Walker, to the 17th National Convention of the Communist Party in December of 1959. The opening day of the hearings, Thursday, May 12, finds City Hall almost completely surrounded by picketers protesting the committee's appearance. Inside the building, the committee has reserved the largest hearing room in the city with a seating capacity of over 400 to accommodate an anticipated crowd. Upon request, the committee has issued nearly 100 passes to individuals representing various patriotic and religious groups, and the remainder of the chambers is filled with students, longshoremen, and the wives and relatives of subpoenaed witnesses. Officials admit spectators to the room's capacity while others are asked to remain outside until vacancies occur. At this point, professional communist agitators in the halls begin leading the crowd in chants and songs while the committee attempts to conduct its proceedings inside. During the morning session, the student contingent, together with subpoenaed communists, succeeded in disrupting the committee hearings time and time again. Shortly after 11 o'clock, Chairman Willis is forced to ask police to eject Archie Brown, several students, and Merle Brodsky from the hearing room. Douglas Walker is called to the stand and interrogated by staff director Richard Aaron. He is asked about his Communist Party membership and his activities as a communist in various phases of college life. 
I respectfully object to the question on the same ground. Any question as to my political beef, beliefs, association statements deprive me of the right of free speech, press, assembly, and petition. The House Un-American Activities Committee serves no real legislative or constitutional purpose. It punishes individuals. And You're reading from a prayer, prayer speech. You're reading from a prepared statement. That's all right. Let me read the question. Continue me. reading it, please. It punishes individuals and groups for their politi political ideas and associations through public exposure well, now, and I'm condemnation. Now, I'm sorry. Uh, you are refusing to answer on the basis of the first amendment. Is that correct? I have, I, I have objected to the question. It punishes individuals and groups for their political ideas and associations from public exposure and condemnation, often resulting in economic sanction. I cannot cooperate with the committee in answering any such questions. I feel I have an obligation as a, as a citizen of this country to preserve the Constitution, and I do not feel I can do so in good conscience by allow, allowing the House and American Activities Committee to inquire into my beliefs or associations. Mr. Wachter has not at this point invoked provisions against self-incrimination of the Fifth Amendment. He is ordered and directed to answer a question concerning his Communist Party membership. I decline to answer that question on the grounds previously stated, and I also respectfully refuse to answer that question on the constitutional grounds that I cannot be forced to bear witness against myself. During the noon luncheon recess, a protest rally in Union Square attracts nearly a thousand students and spectators. They listen intently as two San Francisco assemblymen and a prominent clergyman unleash bitter attacks against the House Committee on Un-American Activities. The rally is designed to incite further resentment against the committee and to recruit more volunteers for action. The rally accomplishes its major objectives for during the afternoon session, hundreds of additional students crowd into the corridors of City Hall, attempting to gain entry to the already overcrowded hearing room. Students, left outside the room, step up their chanting and singing, turning the hallways of City Hall into complete chaos. Officials are unable to maintain order. Meanwhile, a group of subpoenaed communist witnesses have already begun a demonstration inside the hearing room as the committee prepares to hear the first testimony of the afternoon. Chairman Willis calls for order, but to no avail. And the members of Congress wait through the hostilities as a specially trained police squadron is called to the scene to attempt to restore order. From left to right, you see Communist Party members Ralph Izzard, Archie Brown, Salutarian Sweet, and Saul Wachter all especially trained in agitation and incitement to riot.
On request of Chairman Willis, policemen removed the resisting demonstrators from the hearing room. First, Archie Brown. Then, Ralph Izzard. Saul Wachter. Morris Graham. Merle Brodsky. Juanita Wheeler. And finally, Sally Aterian Sweet. Chairman Edwin Willis issues another call for law and order in the hearing room. That these hearings have been conducted in a dignified fashion. The only reason, the only earthly reason why the uh, people show is not open is this. In no courtroom in America are people allowed from the side aisle unless they order in no picture show or other public function of people allowed in the side aisle without uh, being ordered. That is the only reason why this thing has been brought about. We were very patient this morning. We will continue to be patient, but firm and decisive. Now, uh, this thing was brought about by the disorderly conduct this morning. On the second day of the hearings, Friday, May 13th, loudspeakers are set up across the street from City Hall in an attempt to alleviate the crowds trying to gain entrance to the hearing room. Nevertheless, hundreds of students, longshoremen, and spectators crowd into the City Hall building as picketers continue to demonstrate outside the building. Officials admit over 200 of the crowd to the hearing room until it is once again filled to capacity. see Vincent Hallinan, Progressive Party candidate for the President of the United States in 1952, served a prison term from 1954 to 1956, and attorney for several of the communist witnesses called to testify at the hearings. As was the case on Thursday, several professional communist agitators and student leaders direct the activity of those waiting in the hallways. 
chants and songs get louder and defiance to police attempts to maintain order becomes more universal. Students enthusiastically join in on the refrains to the songs, abolish the committee, we shall not be moved, lyrics to which are lifted from the old communist people's songbook. Demonstrations in the hallways of City Hall become so loud that the judges in their chambers on the third floor are unable to continue court procedures. During the morning, the judges give orders to the sheriff and police officials to remove the demonstrators from City Hall immediately. As pamphlets continue to be distributed among the demonstrators, police officials once again warn the students and agitators involved that they must be quiet or the orders of the judges will be enforced. The police warnings are met with jeers and boos and renewed chanting and renewed singing. Finally, during the noon lunch and recess, the judges in their chambers give official orders now to remove the demonstrators from City Hall. When an attempt is made to carry out the order, the crowd responds by throwing shoes and jostling the police officers. When one officer warns that fire hoses will have to be used if the crowd does not disperse, the demonstrators become more and more unruly. One student provides the spark that touches off the violence when he leaps over a barricade, grabs a police officer's nightstick, and begins beating the officer over the head. As the mob surges forward to storm the doors, a police inspector orders that the fire hoses be turned on. At this point, leaders of the group give orders to resist police enforcement. The crowd, now in open defiance of law and order, begins singing once again, we shall not be moved. Riot squad police reinforcements arrive on the scene and are met by boos and jeers from the rioters. The communist agitators give new orders now students to sit down with their backs to the fire hoses and put their hands in their pockets after interlocking arms in what is described later by student newspapers as non-violent resistance. Police, enforcing judicial orders to remove the demonstrators from the building, take the defiant students one by one by the feet and slide them down the wetted marble stairs of City Hall. On several occasions, the pattern of so-called non-violent resistance is broken openly by defiant students. Those who have defied the law are taken to waiting police wagons and are hurried off to police headquarters where they are booked on counts of disturbing the peace, inciting a riot, and resisting arrest. The communist and pro-communist press, of course, charge police brutality. Their press accounts of the rioting describe repeated incidents of policemen cruelly beating innocent students. The innocent, peaceful students, it is stated in these communist press accounts, were physically hurled down two stories of stairs, toppling head over heel, and landed unconscious at the bottom where they were picked up and thrown into the paddy wagons. These films, taken by newsmen on the scene and edited only to the point of removing repetition show a clear example of the lack of respect for truth, which is common practice within the communist propaganda press. The Communist Party emerges from the riots with only a handful of its party members arrested and none injured. Four students suffer minor injuries. Eight policemen are injured to the point where they require hospitalization.
Five officers were seriously hurt, two suffering heart attacks, and three are treated for deep cuts. Here you see Patrolman Frank Dunphy, aged 61, who suffered a stroke when he was knocked down by student agitators. One of the communist professional agitators arrested is Vernon Bowne, who was, in 1954, among the notorious Louisville Seven, charged at that time with sedition, destruction of property, conspiring to destroy property to achieve a political end, and contempt of court. Douglas Wachter, the 19-year-old student leader, was another Communist Party member who was arrested. At the police station, the rebellious students appear to have lost a little of their blatant enthusiasm and defiance, for without the psychological stimulus of mass chanting and singing, the individual students seem somewhat conscious and ashamed of what they have done. No longer is there the air of defiance. The organized resistance has been changed into individual confusion. These young people have been duped into openly resisting and defying law enforcement duped by a handful of communist agitators. Another congressman assigned to the subcommittee conducting hearings in San Francisco is Congressman August E. Johansson of Michigan. Congressman Johansson. The students whose activities you have just witnessed, whether they realize it or not, are, as I pointed out to them in San Francisco, toying with treason. They have been handpicked by the communists to do the dirty work of the communists. Perhaps this is the greatest danger of all. The pattern of communist revolution and insurrection throughout the world has been to indoctrinate and train dupes to carry the party directive into the field while the communists themselves remain in the shadows through a careful propaganda and smear campaign, the communists are able to inject a few with the virus. The disease spreads rapidly among their friends and associates and a so-called spontaneous movement suddenly takes form. From this point on, the communists are relatively free to sit on the sidelines, issue occasional directives, and watch as their desires and projects are fulfilled to the perfection of their wildest dreams. Among those arrested in the city hall at San Francisco were a few trained communist agents. The others were the unwitting dupes of the party who had, in the heat of chanting and singing, performed like puppets with the communists in control of the strings, even to the point of willfully and deliberately defying law and order. The communists have admittedly chosen the minds of our youth as a number one area for their insidious attack. You have seen the evidence of their success. My fellow citizens, what you have just seen and heard is a challenge not only to the patriotic youth of our nation, but to every citizen who is determined that we shall maintain our freedom. You have seen two types of communist-inspired violence, one taking the form of mass challenges of authority and defiance of law and order inside a congressional hearing room, the other coming in the form of open rioting and physical resistance to law enforcement. A third type of communist tactic, common in the Operation Abolition Campaign, is defiance by individual witnesses and their attorneys to the committee itself. Archie Brown, already ejected from the hearing room on two occasions, is called to the stand and sworn in. He asks the chairman to shift the lights. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. 
chairman. Could we uh, shift the lights a bit? Just shift them. Archie Brown, second in command in the California Communist Party, is a top West Coast agitator. Ironically, he is appearing as a witness in the hearing room of the Board of Supervisors of San Francisco only six months after he himself received some 35,000 votes as a candidate for that same board. He is asked by Staff Director Richard Ahrens to identify himself. My name is Archie Brown. I live at uh, 1027 Brussels Street, San Francisco. I am a longshoreman. I want to state, uh, Mr. Chairman, that uh, well, the school, I'm I, I, know, but I have something to, today, I have something to tell the committee. On you by this committee. I want to tell the committee. Here today, in response to a subpoena which is served upon you by this committee. My family is Are being you threatened. Today, in response to a subpoena which is served upon you by this committee. Mr. My Chairman, I expect to suggest the witness now be ordered and directed to answer the question. I uh, direct you to answer that question. Are you afraid today in response to a subpoena served upon you by this committee? Yes, it was served on me by this committee. And are you represented by counsel? That I am. Counsel, will you kindly identify yourself? George Anderson. Mr. Brown, where and when were you born? Mr. Uh, Chairman, I want to state that I, uh, I direct you to answer the question. That's the only way we can proceed orderly. Well, uh... I was subpoenaed here. You are under direction. Where and when were you born? But I, I was subpoenaed here, and uh, my proceed family. Proceed with the next my, question. And my family gave us, if you please, proceed sir. Proceed with the next question. My, so I was born in Sioux City, Iowa. Mr. Chairman, I respect to suggest that with us now be ordered and directed to answer the outstanding principal question. You what is the answer? What is the outstanding principal question? The outstanding principal question is where and when were you born? I already said it. Give us then, please, a word about your education. As Archie Brown attempts time and time again to read a lengthy propaganda statement, he is repeatedly admonished by Chairman Willis that he must answer the questions of the committee and conduct himself in an orderly manner, or he will be removed from the hearing room for the third time. Under the, under the rule of the committee, you may file that paper with our director at this time, if you wish to. I wish to read this statement. I wish to, I want to read this statement, Mr. Chairman. How come that you're bridling me? I want to explain my position. I want, all right, I want to, I want to. Uh, you may file the statement, you may not read it. I want to read my uh, statement and why make a motion. Uh, I direct you, sir, to escort the witness outside the courtroom. Amendment 14 of the Constitution. Another defiant witness is William Mandel, an identified agent of the Communist Party, who is employed as a radio and television news commentator in the San Francisco Bay Area. William Mandel is a top communist propagandist, serving the party in the underground areas as an instructor in communist training schools and operating for the party in public circles, posing as a respected newsman. He displays his bitter defiance of the committee in answer to questions concerning his communist party membership and activities. Did you think that I am going to cooperate with this collection of Judases, of men who sit there in violation of the United States Constitution. If you think I'll cooperate with you in any way, you are insane. Now, sir, we may lecture. When asked about his role as a communist in lecturing before the communist-conceived California Labor School in San Francisco, William Mandel replies, This question has no purpose other than to harass me. When I was asked this question last in 1943 by the late Joe McCarthy, and let me say that I am honored when people come up to me on the streets, perhaps they don't deserve this honor, and say, you're the man who killed Joe McCarthy. 
because I happened to appear on the first day of the book burning hearing, and I did my best to conduct myself in the manner which I'm conducting myself today. If there were any such evidence against me under any law, the proper authorities could move against me. This body is improperly constituted. It is a kangaroo court. It does not have my respect. It has my utmost contempt. And I am not going to answer that question, sir. This, then, is the pattern employed by the communists, their dupes and sympathizers, in Operation Abolition. Another congressman assigned to the subcommittee conducting hearings in San Francisco is Congressman Gordon H. Scherer of Ohio. Congressman Scherer. One of the top communist agents assigned to Operation Abolition is Frank Wilkinson, recently convicted for contempt of Congress for refusal to answer questions concerning his Communist Party membership and activities. Frank Wilkinson's job for the Communist Party consists of one prime duty, to incite resistance and trouble for the House Committee on Un-American Activities in any given location where the committee is to conduct hearings. Frank Wilkinson was in San Francisco during the May hearing. He arrived in the city prior to the committee to organize the so-called spontaneous public demonstrations against the committee and the hearings. Moreover, he was actually in the corridors issuing instructions and inciting hostile action against the committee during the hearings. Frank Wilkinson was interviewed by newsmen shortly after he had been agitating among the student demonstrators. Uh, listen to this interview closely, because in it you will hear Frank Wilkinson, a communist agent, explain his communist jargon, his function for Operation Abolition. Well, have you had anything to do with the demonstrations in front of the city hall today? No, I've just been an observer of those. I understood uh, you had said you were organizing protests against the committee. Yes, uh, the, one of the things that our committee does, and that I do for our committee, is to come to each community when the committee issues its subpoena to assist the subpoenaed persons and others in the community who are not familiar with the kind of unconstitutional behavior that this committee carries on to assist that community and to assist those subpoenees in their own self-defense. In the committee hearings today, you were called an international communist agent. Are you a communist? <laughs> That's a very flattering remark. I've been frequently called a, a uh, hardcore communist, a local communist by Mr. Aarons, but never an international communist. As far as the basic question is concerned, until the Supreme Court uh, has answered the fundamental constitutional question, which is now pending in my case, which is one of the 36 First Amendment test cases of this committee, until they have resolved this matter and declared these kind of questions under compulsion to be illegal and unconstitutional. Uh, I refuse to answer the questions away from the committee, just as I refuse to answer them directly to the, to the committee when I've been called. That was Frank Wilkinson, a top communist coordinator of Operation Abolition. Now, during the past 45 minutes, you have been witnessing only the surface manifestation of an extensive operation by the communists, which in many phases is subtle, takes the form of articles, letter writing campaigns, and a wide range of other smear activities. Not for the purpose of improving the investigative techniques of congressional committees, and not for the purpose of defending civil liberties as they would have you believe, but for the avowed objective of destroying the Committee on Un-American Activities and our nation's entire security program. You have seen communism in action, the same communism which is, at this instant, attempting to devour the world through subversion, revolution, deceit, sabotage, and vicious propaganda. You have, through these films, seen communism with its mask ripped off, with its sweet facade uncovered, and its hard, bitter, and determined core 
revealed. 